give you an idea about what was called the Contributor Role Taxonomy Project and is now called Credit. I want to talk about what it was, what it is, <laughs> and what it was, how we got to where we are, why we need it, what's been done so far, where can it be used, and what's the status. So it's a um, taxonomy to help improve recognition and details on all contributor roles in a published work. So as you know, we have um, uh, more and more scholarly research and collaboration um, is more extensive than it was before. We seldom have one person writing an article all by themselves. Um, and there's a, a significantly growing interest in who are the stakeholders in scholarship and the increasing of transparency in research so that we know what people are talking about um, and who did what, who made the model, who was the engineer, um, and how come this person gets to be the first author? And is the final author only there because they run the lab or did they actually contribute um, substantively to the actually published work. So specific roles for um, all the contributors and what role they play in a collaborative work. It would give more precise and extensive identification for a paper. It would identify all the roles, many of which are sometimes recognized in acknowledgments and no place else. Um, and it gives much better credit to supporting roles. And eventually, um, you could use that data to help auto-populate um, the author name fields, which is, of course, interest to us. You also know that the role of author is no longer clear. It's not a single person who's written the seminal work on X. Um, and frequently, it does not represent the complexity uh, that, of all the different supporting roles. So if you get a paper published in AIP with 4,000 authors, or 4,300 authors, I think is their top number, which is a lot. Well, how come all those people got listed as an author anyway? What did, what did they do? Um, so we want to get an idea of what role each played, and we're also optimistic that um, we can have recognition of funding contributions so that when people's paper is funded by a particular agency, it may or may not give a um, indication of conflict of interest. I mean, if Merck, uh, the pharmaceutical company, funds a paper that's about their research, should the reader know that or does it matter? Um, and I think people frequently think it does matter. And there's the people that built the model, the engineers that ran the uh, work, the guy who did the analysis in the lab, and all those kinds of people are frequently not recognized at all. And if you want to do any kind of collaboration, you need to get hold of those people. So the corresponding author um, is, is a popular um, thing, particularly in humanities, but increasingly in science as well, where um, in physics and medical and biological sciences, um, so that perhaps we need each of the authors to state what they think their contribution is, so that we don't get these heavy disagreements about recognition of my contribution on this thing. Um, for example, we just published a paper uh, last year about this work in Nature. And as an afterthought, they added me as the fourth author, even though we did all the work. You know, So it was kind of one of those, well, they weren't going to recognize us at all, but they wanted us to review the paper. Excuse me, but so, so we got together a group of about 100 people um, to try to get a list of about 12-ish terms. So it's a 10 to 12 term list. It's 14 at the moment. Um, to make a taxonomy that's suitably generic, but will reflect the granularity that we need so that we can have precision in the documents. Um, we also wanted it to be cross-disciplinary because during this work we certainly found out that humanities, medical sciences, biological sciences 
um, cite people differently. They list their offers differently. Some of them list them alphabetically. Um, some of them list major contributor first. Um, there's a whole slice of science that always lists the head of the lab as the final author. Even if they had nothing to do with the paper, they're still always there um, because they run the lab. And so that gives a, a shell for people to operate in. And we also needed to be sure that we didn't, in building a taxonomy like this, introduce some perverse um, <coughs> incentives to people. You know, you here's a standard or here's a new legislative act and suddenly people behave differently um, than they did before and so we didn't want any of those kind of contraindications if we could avoid them. We also pretty firmly decided that funding is not an author role. Just because you got funding for the research does not necessarily mean that you qualify as an author according to this group of 104 publishers. And of course covering the different approaches from different organizations. So any of you that have been to a movie or watched a TV show in the last 10 years knows that the list of credits scrolls on and on and on and on and the second dolly grip is recognized and um, the third person to do makeup on actor Y is also listed and so on. So they have a lot of um, credits. It's not that we want to do quite that level of detail in getting to recognize what authors are doing, but we do want to have some recognition of the credit. <clears throat> so how did we get here? We started with a uh, workshop at Harvard in the, in the spring of 2011. It was sponsored by the Wellcome Trust, so Amy Brand at Harvard got together with Liz Allen from the Wellcome Trust and wanted to talk about ways that we could improve the recognition and details. And we published an initial report that fall, um, which is available on, um, at this URL, should you want it. I'm happy to give it to you. It's also on the slide set that you got on the uh, thumb drive. Um, and it recognized all the people that attended the meeting and the contributions that they gave. To create the taxonomy, we needed to mine the literature and see what people were doing. Um, how did people cite all the contributions now? Um, we also got anecdotal contributions from the team. Um, we reviewed other models, and we drafted the taxonomy, and Gabe Carr did most of that work. Much. He, shows the, um, he shows the scars from it. Um, and then we had it vetted by the team and validated by the publishers. So I can tell you that building a 12-term taxonomy with a group of 104 SMEs is a lot harder than building a 7,000-term taxonomy with SME interviews. So we mined the uh, JATS contributor element in the AIP articles because we were processing them, and Fred Dillo was part of the steering committee for this work, so he was certainly in favor of it. We also um, went through 10 years of Medline, um, looking for how they recognized the contributors there, both in the author and the other uh, fields, including contributor and acknowledgments. Mika Altman from Brown University mined through the acknowledgment sections in the Elsevier data. And we also looked at David Chotten's work. Um, he built a model called SCORO, which I don't, I can't remember all the pieces of that acronym, but it stands for um, scholarly contribution, um, and he's built a taxonomy of about 500 terms to support this work, and it's available um, on his own website <coughs> at this at this listing. People thought that um, David's model was a bit too elaborate. They wanted to keep the list small, and we came up with what we call edition one of the taxonomy, um, and then we validated that taxonomy using 25 publishers. And the way we wanted them to evaluate it was to actually look at 50 articles um, and involve the corresponding authors and see if they could um, complete a survey on it and apply roles to all the authors on those 50 articles from 25 publishers. <coughs> and then there were several iterations of the taxonomy after that looking at 
and trying it out on, on nature. We looked at the um, way that DTIC does it, IEEE played a role, and uh, so did PLOS. So, and there was a small micro, micro attribution survey that was done to look at how do people really cite contributions. We took all the spreadsheets um, that returned and got the relevant author names, which included the journal information, and looked at how the participating authors had listed their um, information. So I can show you all 12 iterations of this taxonomy, but this is the current list of um, terms used for recognition of roles that people have played in the creation of an article. And I'm going to go through each of these um, to tell you what, you what we meant by them. But there is now a website for credit um, issued as an open standard. Um, and you can go to this website, find out more about it, and also um, be an early implementer. So what we were building was a classification of the <coughs> many roles that were played by people. It's not limited to traditional author roles. And it also has a levels one through three in level of contribution to any particular contributor role that somebody played. So that everybody who plays an, a role in creating the article can be recognized. <coughs> might be a single person, might be many people played equal roles. So the first one is conceptualization, those people that put together the idea and the research goal and aims. So who thought up this project anyway? The second is who designed the methodology. And sometimes all of this is done by one person, but in today's day and age, usually not. We had the creation of models. So sometimes they're a physical model. Sometimes it might be a climate change model. It's all, there are all kinds of models. And if you want to build on somebody else's research, it's really nice to know who built that original model so that you can maybe talk to them, maybe collaborate with them further. Um, who did the software? This is a fairly new but um, under-recognized role in um, research today. So who did the, who wrote the code? Who designed the computer programs? And who tested them? Who put all that software part together behind the scenes? And who verified the work? Who validated it? It's a made sure that this research was actually true um, and make sure that somebody else could reproduce the same results because if it's not reproducible, um, other people can't build on that research. And then the formal analysis, and analysis can be done in many ways. It might be visualization, it might be synthesis of the study data, it could be the design and execution of formal techniques. It could be testing stuff in test tubes in the lab. It could be doing materials analysis like Paul Cotula showed us this morning. And then who did the investigation? Who thought up and set up the experiments? So who said, these are the things we're trying to prove and this is the path we're going to take to, to prove them? Who, who did that work? Who gathered the evidence? Who cultivated the, well, no, who, who looked at and gathered the data and the evidence. Um, and then the resources, um, who kept track of all that stuff? How do you know that bottle of anthrax was actually stored on the shelf in that lab or not? Who's keeping track of all the reagents and all of the pieces needed and the, the clients? The patients in a clinical clinical study who's keeping track of and shepherding the animals um, to make sure that they maintain separate um, groups of mice so that they don't get cross-contamination. All those kinds of things. There's a tremendous amount of work in big science now to shepherd the resources that are used. And then who kept track of the data? He was the curator of it to make sure that the data was locatable, reproducible, um, and usable again. So um, that would include everything from annotating, annotating and the metadata to um, keeping track of and archiving the software code. So big science projects for 
often have a data curation person or a curation librarian nowadays, and those are not widely recognized in the research papers themselves, although they can be pretty important. And then the role that we think of as authorship, the actual writing of the paper. Who, who wrote the first draft? Who, who created the skeleton, the framework for the published paper? And then who was involved in reviewing and editing that paper? That can be a pretty significant role. I know for the papers that I write, without Barbara curating them for me, they would not be nearly as good. So who does that behind the scenes? And who does it pre-publication? <coughs> And is there somebody that massages it after publication for new venues, for example? There's increasing amount of visualization and graphics um, used in the publication of a paper. So who did that neat chart for you? Who did that really cool graphic visualization of the research that you created? Who is that unsung member of the team? We'd like to know about it so we can use him in our research. And then, of course, supervisory roles are, are important, making the space available that people can do um, the planning and the execution, and maybe somebody who mentors the core team and guides them forward to completion. Project administration, depending on the project, is also important. Who's keeping track of um, all of the pieces of a big research project and making sure that they run forward according to the project plan. And finally, the funding. Who, who got the funding and who is the funder of this project? It's important to know that kind of thing in research. So that's the 14 terms that are currently in use. Um, there is a principles of use document for this data as well. Um, and it, it does say that we want to have a level of contribution. So are you... you the only one who did it, or you one of the three? Um, did you have kind of a secondary or tertiary role, so you kind of tangentially touched it, or were you the main person? Um, and often, just because somebody talked with you one afternoon and gave you a, a few hints does not necessarily mean that they qualify to be a full author on the paper. As same thing with funding. Just because you got the money for the project does not mean that you are necessarily entitled to an authorship role. And we're, we're looking for a way to make this mineable, consistent data, so we're hoping that people will use the terms as they appear in the taxonomy. It's been quite a hard task to get those people to stick to the um, standards in describing their terminology, and I'll show you some of the earlier uh, editions, and you'll see what I mean. Um, so we are optimistic that all the roles are covered, but if the roles are not covered and somebody feels like they need another term added to the taxonomy, then the vector for giving that feedback is to go through the credit website. In the guidelines for use, people should use the most applicable roles, and they can add roles if they'd like to. Uh, we'd like them to add them under uh, one of our 14, so they would be like a narrower term. Um, and you can use multiple words for the people listed, so somebody could get all 14 roles, hypothetically. <coughs> This is an example of using credit in an author submission system. This happens to be the EJ Press uh, system, and here you see they have um, author contribution and then a drop-down list of the um, roles. This is, this is a slide from a few weeks ago, but this is actually version 8 of the taxonomy. So here's the same. Uh, drop-down list with version 12 added in as a checklist in the credit list. So that pop-up list um, is included whenever somebody wants to submit a paper, upload a paper to a system using the EJ Press system. And if you mouse over these terms, you get a uh, definition of what that is. So an author would know what we meant by that term. And if you wanted to add a role. This is the ORCID listing. Um, and so for ORCID, it says, what is your role? And then 
is postdoc a role? I mean, what, what role did the postdoc play? That's a title. That's not really a role. That doesn't give you any idea of what, did they make the model? Did they write the paper? Did they do the research? You can't tell. Were they the person who did the visualization? No idea from this drop down list. So we have on the steering committee of this two people that are sitting on the ORCID board and they are optimistic they can get ORCID to change this to real contributor roles instead of um, that listing. Um, let's see, so ORCID does include a contributor, uh, contributor role, which is part of the JADS taxonomy. Um, they just don't fill it in with a appropriate list, although we are optimistic that they will move to um, the list that credit has put forth instead of the uh, role list. So this is a possible map to JATS, the way that there are a number of fields in the in the JATS, the Journal of Art Article Tagging System that can be used for contributors and a proposal has gone forth to JATS or is, is forthcoming to JATS that will take some of these roles and say this is where the data goes. So we have collab, contrib, contrib group, role, and principal investigator, principal award recipient are all parts of the contrib role, uh, the contrib element in JATS. So if we can, we'll get them to put it into the, um, uh, put this list into the contrib ID tag. So it's now ready for implementation. Um, EJ Press has adopted it. Uh, Nature has adopted it. Science has adopted it as a thing for the input. I'm not sure if PLOS has adopted it yet or not, but they did have a person on the steering committee who was involved in it. You know, I saw something about it. I think it's on the way. Yeah, yeah. I think I it's think happen. we're very, very, very excited about all this. Yeah. So, and and it's it's can be pretty powerful. So, we're looking forward to having it in the Jets DTD. We are looking forward to having it in Orchid, um, and there is a proposal going forward to NISO to the um, Content Collaboration Committee to have them decide whether it should be advanced as a candidate standard for NISO, but what we really look forward to is a best indication, very clearly stated, on what role each person who is listed as an author plays. So this is a, uh, just pasted from the credit website saying um, what they're hoping to uh, gather and all of the benefits that we see from the, um, from the group. That's it. This is version one. This is version two. Don't you love those nice long phrases? <laughs> this is version three. Getting there. This is version four. Still not there. Version five, version six, version seven, version eight, which was the first one to be implemented by some people. <coughs> version nine, version 10. Version 11, and I showed you version 12 earlier. So I think we are fairly close to being accepted. And this is an indication of the um, guidelines for use, where somebody was a lead, they were supporting, or all contributors were equal. And this this particular op option is still um, not necessarily broadly implemented. Who's involved? This is the original steering committee. Amy Brand was the. Uh, convener for it, um, and you see that Ginny Barber from PLOS was, and if, for those of you that know Ginny Barber, she's a short little woman, but man, she has major impact on anything she's in, and she and Veronique together really kept us all on our toes. Uh, the current steer steering committee for moving it forward is this group. I cannot be on this group at the moment because I do sit on the contact and collaboration board for NISO, and so I can't really too much of a conflict of interest. Um, these people have already in, um, implemented it as a pilot, and other people that had data mined for this project or were part of that group are listed here. So it's been a fun project. <laughs>